Welcome into the Skinny Podcast. It's the weekly Pre edition. I'm Richard Skinner, Local12.com digital sports columnist and editor with Rick Broering. As always, it's presented by Blake, the attorney, Maislin. Rick, we have got a ton to get to with Bengals training camp underway, the trade deadline in Major League Baseball coming and going, uh, fist fights after TBT games. I mean, we got so much to get to. Let's just get to it. Uh, Let's do it. We are a full week into Bengals training camp. So let's start by taking a look at the top headlines so far a week in. Number one, you got to start with Jamar Chase. He has yet to practice in training camp due to what is believed to be a hold in over his apparent desire for a lucrative contract extension. You wrote a column titled, if Chase's hold in is going to have any effect, he could be willing to miss games. So Skinny, why don't we start by you taking us through that? It's on local12.com right now if you want to read it. All right, so he's under contract for two more years. This year is the final year of his rookie deal. They picked up his fifth-year option for next year. So there's really no leverage point, right? I mean, other than he thinks maybe he's going to get a groundswell from the fan base that will convince the the ownership group, Mike Brown in particular, to go ahead and, and do the extension. And they still might. I mean, there's a possibility they could. Um, I don't think they're going to. Um, th- th- there's no There's no. Uh, urgency point at the moment because he's under contract. That's kind of how this league works. You have control of a player for so long. You can control him for even another year if they're a first round draft pick, but it comes at a pretty princely sum, $21.8 million. Then you can franchise tag a guy once or twice. And um, then, you know, you can try to sign him to a contract. Usually, you know, fifth year, if you still like the guy and he's worth it, you're going to go ahead and sign him. I mean, Joe Burrow played through his fourth year and then they signed him. And so I, I just don't know what, what what the leverage point is for him, and that's why I pointed out, unless he's willing to take this to the nth degree and just not play during the season, I mean, would it make any sense if three weeks from now he finally goes, you know what, I'm going to practice? What did what what did that serve? Well, we'll talk about what the likelihood is that he actually will sit out, but in terms of what it might serve right now, is there any chance that he's just trying to preserve – how many reps he's taken in practice that don't matter to decrease the chance of a, a oh, silly injury? Yes, yeah, some. I, I can see some of that. I can see some of that. But let's not forget that at the scouting combine, Dan Pitcher, the offensive coordinator, talked openly about, I'd like to get Jamar in the slot more. Wouldn't you like to see what that looks like? Wouldn't you like to see Joe Burrow, who's not throwing the way Joe Burrow used to throw at the moment? The ball comes out of his hands a little wonky at times, a little different at times. Wouldn't you like to, to to see those two get on some kind of same page? And you can argue, well, they've been playing since LSU. This is different Joe Burrow at the moment. It just is. Um, and and again, if they're going to try to look move Jamar around, wouldn't you like to see what that looks like in training camp? Absolutely, I would. Absolutely, the Bengals would. And I'm sure Joe Burrow would even. But Jamar Chase is the one holding in right now and not participating. Is it, potent- is it possible that just he and his agent are saying, look, We'll play when the the lights are on and the games are on the line, but like we're not going to go through practice and take the chance of getting hurt during practices. Is that a possibility? Sure, that is a possibility, but I still don't know what that served other than to your point, preservation. But um, that, that's the only thing I can see now. Now, what do you think the possibility is that he would actually sit out games? I don't think it's highly likely because I I mean if you're going to want to get paid, you're going to want to put performance out on the field. Um, but I would tell you this: your risk of injury is far greater in a game than it is in practice. No question, but I do get the, I mean, guys get hurt every year in training camp, right? I mean, it happens. We've seen guys lost for the year in training camp. So, I mean, there is a a non-zero chance that he ends up hurt in practice, even if you're trying to take precautions with him. And I get the standpoint of, look, like if, if you're not going to give me my guaranteed money, then I'm going to try to decrease risk as much as possible. If you want me working in the slot, you want me working before the season and doing all these extra things, then pay me what a receiver of my value is worth at this time. Now, I'm not saying the Bengals should do that. I I really don't think they should. I think the Bengals have all the leverage here. I don't think they've done anything wrong by Jamar Chase to this point. I think the way they've handled this is absolutely fine and absolutely their right. If Jamar Chase and his agent have an issue with that, then figure out a different collective bargaining agreement next time when you're uh, the player's go to negotiate that. I mean, really, that's what this comes down to. The Bengals are doing, they, they don't have a lot of options in terms of what they're allowed to do to uh, extract value when negotiating these contracts with, with superstar players. One of their options right now is they don't have to guarantee Jamar Chase a ton of money two years uh, out from when they actually need to do so. Yeah, and here's the two-way street of this. And, and there is a two-way street to this, in my opinion. Um, so to your point, if this is what Jamar is doing, of just saying, I'm, I'll, I am I made the point to some people, August 28th feels like the right day. It's the day after cut down day and all of those things that he'll, he'll report that gives him a, a basically two week ramp up and he's ready to go. Um, 
And at that point, you're not doing much live stuff because you're kind of preparing for, for games. Um, you're preparing for the game, for the, for the season opener. Um, but the flip side of this is, okay, if he's doing this piece, he's not, you know, he wants the guaranteed money, all those things. If, let's just say the Bengals do extend him and two years into it, he suffers a catastrophic injury and they're on the hook for three more years of guaranteed money. Is he, is he going to give that back? Right. Should he give that not. back? Of course not. Right. So, so there, there's a there's a risk on the Bengals. While there's a risk for him to play and practice right now, there's a risk for the Bengals to give guaranteed money three, four, and five years out right now. Yeah, and that's you know as much as typically we always take the player side in these situations, and I think for good reasons in a lot of cases. I mean, who wants to take the side of a, a billionaire owner when you know the players are are making millions and they're the ones out there playing on the field and, and entertaining us and all of that. But I, I still think there is way too much of, across all sports, not just the NFL, but across all sports, there's way too much of guy signs contract. And that's always part of the signing the contract is you're deciding when to bet on yourself, right? You're deciding like, do I want to take this guaranteed money right now, even though maybe I'm not at my highest value or do I want to wait another year? Maybe my value will be even higher and then I'll sign it. Yeah. But, hundred, like, hundred. Hunter Green's a great example, right? Um, Perfect example. The, the Reds kind of bet on him um, becoming this ace pitcher. They paid him a nice sum. He felt comfortable in that sum, but he's elevating himself above that. But at the same time, you're now got him locked up for a, for a chunk of time. That's kind of the way, to your point, this works. Yeah, and it's just frustrating from a fan's perspective that it seems like across all sports, no matter what, if any guy plays well for a year or two, then it's like, you know what? Screw that contract that we signed. I'm now going to hold out and we need to, you either need to trade me or I need a new contract. And to some of that, I get it. It's your leverage. If you play really well, you get to do some of those things, but it's just getting exhausting. It's making it hard to watch sports and enjoy them and enjoy these athletes. It's like, guys, figure out your collective bargain agreements. And then once you sign your contract, to some shut extent, up. that's the contract. Like you yeah, got to play that up. out a little bit. Yeah. Trey Hendrickson, shut up. I mean, trade me, right? Trade me or I'll retire. You're not going to retire. What are, you about? I mean, what are we talking about, guy? They just extended you. They just gave you more money. So you didn't have to sign that deal then. You could have said, no, I'm good. I'm going to play out this contract and then try to get more money. No, you said, I like what you're giving me now. I'm going to take it. Okay, then shut up and play. Yeah, Trey Hendrickson was way worse because he's at least already making big time money. Yeah. Like Jamar Chase's situation is a little bit different because he's still making that rookie scale money while being a clear cut superstar in the NFL. But as you pointed out, I mean, next year, that's going to change. It's yeah. not like this is a forever thing for him, and and I understand the injury risk, but um, it's I think it's frustrating for Bengals fans. I think ultimately it's not going to be a very big deal in this season's storylines because, Probably like not. you said, right before the season starts, he'll be back and he'll play in games. I think um, one thing I am interested in, though, I I try to listen to everyone else's content that covers the team. I, I obviously like everyone who covers the Bengals. I didn't hear anyone else talking about the potential for Jamar Chase to sit out when training camp started a week or two ago. Yet on our show, you randomly said that. It was the first I had heard of it. You said it, and I was like, what? Why Why would that happen? And then sure enough, it's been the biggest storyline in training camp for the last week. What? Where did that come from? Why did you know that was going to happen? Um, it just, it, seeing what he did in, in mini camp and just knowing the situation the way I kind of know it, um, it just, it, it, it had that vibe of, this is him going to try to make a statement. The fact that the things that Mike Brown said on, on Monday at the, uh, at the luncheon, um, you know, that, that, that now we're kind of in the, the off season's kind of over. We're kind of trying. And I thought, well, that means they're probably not in full negotiation mode, the team um, that they're both sides are pretty far apart. And so he's going to probably try to make a statement and that's what he's tried to do. I just, again, I, I, I don't, I don't think the Bengals are going to blink on the guaranteed money. Um, I'm going to guess the Bengals are seeking a four-year extension where Jamar, and I understand this, he probably wants a three-year extension so he can dive back into free agency earlier again. Um, and I just don't think that gets done in this window, especially when Rick, again, you know how things go in life. You work in a deadline business. I work in a deadline. I'm terrible when I have a project hanging over my head. I'm great on deadline. I'm great when there's a sense of urgency to get it done. There's no sense of urgency on either side to get it done. So neither side's going to cave at the moment. They're going to give maybe an inch here and an inch there, but it's not like the 11th hour that if they don't sign Jamar chase, you know, uh, he's going to walk and, and flip side is, is the same. I mean, he's got two more years on a contract, so there's no sense of urgency. And that's where I just don't, it, it felt like 
based on what I saw in minicamp and where this thing was going to go from a contract perspective, that he had the possibility to do it. And lo and behold, he has. You've clearly stated that you don't think this is the case, but what? how surprised would you be if the Bengals' Jamar Chase announced a new contract extension within the next week or two that really they're holding him out right now because they're trying to finalize that? So so it's. I joke with some people on the beat. I said, I'm going to say this, and I'm going to probably be – way off base that, you know, maybe they are close and this is just him saying, Hey, until I get this thing finalized, I'm not going to practice. I don't believe that's the case. That's not the vibe I'm, I'm, I'm getting at all. That would be a total stunner. I think I, yeah. I, I don't see that happening. I, I've heard a little bit of rumbling, a little bit of joking about maybe that's what's going on here, but I think that would be a complete stunner at this point. All right. Second biggest topic in my opinion over the last week has been the new locker room reveal that happened this week. The players got a chance to go in, see the new locker rooms. The media got a chance to go in and get a tour of that. Now, if you remember uh, a few months ago when we were talking about the NFL Players Association report cards, there were a lot of complaints about the locker rooms, the bathrooms within the locker rooms, some of the upgrades that needed to be done. Skinny, you've now had the chance to look at the locker room in person yourself. T take us through the locker room. What was that like? It's spectacular. You, we got a, a, a photo gallery and, and some videos up at local12.com. Um, I would suggest take a look at those because it is it's it's really if you're a Bengals fan, uh, it's it's cool to look at. I mean, um, you know, I was asked by my boss to take a bunch of pictures so we could put the photo gallery together. And usually, I'm not that guy. I don't get you know like this is really. I just thought the amenities that they had for that thing were cool. Now you you've been in. Uh, you were in the old locker room, oh, Rick, yeah. and it was nice. I thought it was okay. I didn't think it was, you know, a, a palace, but by, by locker room standards, it was it was spacious. It was nice, but it also, you know, the whole not having hot water in the showers is a joke. That 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 shouldn't take place. Um, you know, no phone chargers for players, and, and it seems like this one they took into account everything they could possibly take into account for the players. Um, you know, there's a, a phone charger at the wall, and here's some of the pictures you're gonna look at. There's a phone charger. Um, uh, by the wall. There's also the phone charger where you can just lay it down and the phone charges. There's um, uh, there's a place where players can put their helmet and the 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 place that they can put their helmet is um, has a fan in it and the fan will dry the helmet out at the end of the day. There's a place where they can put their shoulder pads all the way up at the top of the locker, place down the bottom where their shoes can all go that actually has a fan that dries the shoes out after you've used them in a practice session. Um uh, that Paul Brown signature, I think, is a nice little touch. There's the helmet. That that there's like actually kind of a fan in there that will dry the helmet out after you've used it during the day. And and the other part, Rick, is they've got fans that actually circulate the air to send it out. So guess what? We didn't have after yesterday's hot, sweaty practice. You didn't have the usual locker room smell. That's the biggest thing right there. That's really it to me. The 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 stink of the old locker room is really the worst part of it. Now you said this too on your podcast with Chris Renkel, the, the little recap you guys did that it just felt old in the yeah. old locker room. And that's yeah. the best way I describe it. It looked so outdated. It looked like someone's old boardroom that had kind of been converted over to a, a locker room. It just, just didn't feel locker room, especially by 2024 standards. And I, I kind of made the joke on Twitter yesterday, but I was somewhat serious about it. It's like as, as great as this Bengals locker room is, and it is more than you would ever need as a professional athlete to play a sport I started thinking about it like, wait, I feel like as cool as this is, I've seen some pretty impressive stuff in recent locker room reels at the college level. And sure enough, like if you go through oh, sure. any of the top Big Ten SEC schools or whatever, their locker rooms are even more impressive than what the Bengals just revealed. So it's like it's, you know, it was time for an upgrade without question. All right. They do have there's one flaw. And I found it out after practice. And I'm serious about this. So where I told you about in the locker at the very top, there's a pull down where they can put their shoulder pads. The players can put their shoulder pads. Um, and so I'm watching Joe Burrow at his locker trying to reach up. Now, Joe Burrow is six feet four, right? He's not a small guy by any stretch of the imagination. He actually had to get his chair and stand on it to put the shoulder pads in the locker. And I'm like, boy, if that chair like suddenly wobbles or whatever, or he slips and goes down. So I don't know how they're going to rectify that, but by God, they better rectify that. That that that, that, that can't be right. I mean, we, we can't have Joe, Joe Burrow balancing himself on stools to put his uh his shoulder pads away. I, I have to assume that just like they haven't, the players don't know about the button that makes it like, mechanically slide down to their level so they can put it in or something. There's no Maybe. way that's actually a design flaw. Maybe. I'm going to have to keep watching the next few times I'm in there just to see how it goes. Um, I can't imagine like some of those, you know, smallish wide receivers or a Travion Williams who's about five feet eight, five feet nine. I, I don't even know if him standing on a chair will let him reach that thing because Burrow kind of barely reached the thing. 
Skinny, I know the uh, the sort of old guy take here. Heck, I, I think even your take might have been to some extent is like, how much does a locker room matter? It doesn't. It's not really what you need or whatever. But everyone who saw this thing seemed to come away with the take that, man, this is pretty nice. It's yes. pretty awesome looking. And I would go a step farther to say, is this the reason that a free agent decides to come to Cincinnati? Absolutely not. No right, one's correct. signing over a locker yeah. room. They want money. Right. They want a chance to win. Yeah. But there are absolutely things that develop a narrative around your franchise. And the NFL PA report cards are part of this, right? You don't take care of your players. They don't They don't put enough into resources. The, the amenities aren't as nice. Those things become who you are as a yep. franchise. And it's part of who the Bengals had been through all their years of crappiness uh, throughout the 90s and into the 2000s. And they've started to get away from that. And I feel like this was kind of one of the last parts of that is upgrading the amenities, upgrading all the things that they provide for the players. So that's no longer part of their narrative. I think that does matter to some extent. It's not the end all be all. It's not going to make the difference for one individual free agent in the off season, but overall over the course of five to 10 years and what guys are saying about your place when they're, they go to other teams and when they move around within the league, I think it does have somewhat of an impact. And honestly though, don't you also want your players to feel comfortable to, to, to a degree, right? I mean, uh, that's that, a place that they want to be. And, th and that's a group that does like hanging in the locker room, but wouldn't you like to make it as nice as possible for their comfort? And I, I think you could tell the players really appreciated what, what they had done. I, I really believe that. I mean, uh, it's kind of, it's kind of cool mood lighting in there. It has kind of a goofy nightclub feel to it with the lighting. And I, I don't know if that changes like on a game day, if it, the brightness levels up, it just had a mood lighting when we went in, when the players were at practice and then after when the players were at walkthrough and then uh, after the full practice, when we we all went in there to, to do interviews. Um, the lighting was the same. And I thought, oh, I thought maybe the lighting would come up. But I kind of like this little mood lighting. And maybe it's because it was so damn hot outside. The last thing you want to do is jump into bright lights. But um, it was it was pretty cool, too. Well, the, the mood lighting, that's a new thing where it's like it's not just mood lighting, but it's like put on by movement. Right. So like when you walk into it, the little LEDs light up as you go. I've seen that in some of the college things. I do think it looks cool. Now, the one major upgrade is the media guys like the background of the videos now are going to be way better than just yes. that old sort of uh, taupe or khaki colored walls that we always saw in the background. This no, I mean, nicer. it's funny because it, so I took, you know, a ton of photos on my iPhone and, and you know, I got an older iPhone. Those don't always turn out great. But I thought they actually kind of popped for a change and it didn't pop because of my my picture taking skills or the phone itself i think it popped literally because of, of the background that i was shooting into yeah it's all about the lighting without question so the the media content coming out of the locker room just the player interviews and stuff that will look more visually appealing without a doubt all right our third storyline how has joe burrow looked and how are they handling his workload to this point that was the the number one storyline coming into training camp but it kind of got pushed to the back burner a little bit during the course of this first week but what's been the story with burrow yeah, um, he even admitted it after his, I think his his first practice, and we get the chance to talk to him again tomorrow, Thursday after after practice. So I'm interested to see how he thinks the progress is going. He's even admitted it's not spinning the way he would like or the way it has, and you can see that coming off of his hand. It doesn't come off the same. Um, he's had a he's had some un Joe Burrow like throws yesterday in the in the eleven on eleven. He overthrew T Higgins. I mean, like as an in route, it went twenty yards over his head. Um, he had another one that short hopped T on a comeback route. He's had a couple that have been behind guys. It doesn't have the same zip on it, but he also, you watch him. He still looks comfortable in decision-making where the ball's going. Um, he's forced some tight window throws that have been accurate. Um, had a nice one in the back of the end zone you know, on a couple of seven on sevens. And he did the Joe Burrow thing. I thought yesterday in a seven on seven, where he used his eyes and his knowledge of, of where he was going to go and how he was going to affect the defense with his eyes. So it was down about the nine or 10 yard line. It was a red zone, seven on seven. And the defense had kind of a they like they were man to man across and they had a couple of safety help to kind of read in between. So Joe looks into the middle of the field and it's and I'm looking at it initially because I'm watching his, his head and I'm like, man, it's congested in there. All of a sudden, he just casually turns to his left, flips one out to Charlie Jones doing an out route right by the pylon. Easy catch. He strolls into the end zone. I'm like, gosh, that looked easy because he made it look easy. So it's not perfect. It's not where I you, you, you need to hope it's going to go. Um, you know, I, I could argue this is why Jamar Chase needs some reps with Joe Burrow right now, because this this is a different Joe Burrow at the moment. And maybe in the next week, it's back to the old Joe Burrow. But when he talks about not spinning the way he would like, uh, I think he's still getting a feel for it, how much to push it. I think they've done a good job with his workload. He went the first two days last week, 
He had a third scheduled day off. He came out, though, in full uniform helmet, took part in, uh, I think, the only drills. He did a little bit of light throwing, uh, but then he did some handoff drills with the running back, which is, as you know, a timing thing yeah, sometimes. Punting, the way they too, right? And he punted. Um, and I think he was horsing around with it. But, I mean, hey, let's not forget, uh, some teams do have their quarterbacks. I mean, Ben Roethlisberger used to do it with, with Pittsburgh. You know, occasionally in the shotgun on a fourth down situation from a weird field position spot, you'll have the guy uh, punt the ball away and there's hopefully no returner back and you get a chance to pin a team. I mean, I don't think that's what they were doing. I think he was literally just doing it to horse around. But I will say, Darren Simmons, the special teams coordinator, was over there with him the whole time he was doing doing it, talking to him. So, um, you know, maybe that's that's a thing. And then this week, he uh, he threw in the Sunday night practice, um, did, did not throw um, a ton in the Monday practice. He did take part some, and that was a pre-planned limited day, and then was a full go yesterday when they went to full pad. So I think the workload's been good. I think he'll say the workload's been good. And he may say tomorrow, um, I think I'm able to push it a little bit more. Maybe now I'll go. And I will say this, Rick. The first two, um, I guess, tranches of camp, you had three days, day off, three days. Today, they were recording this day off. And from this point forward, it's two days on, day off, two days on, day off, two days on, day off. Games mix into that. So they don't have any other uh, three-game period, three-day periods in, in camp from this point forward um, until you get to um, the the end of cuts and, and towards the regular season, normal week. So I would suspect he may not even get a day off uh, from here on out in camp. Maybe you see a day if something's bugging him that, that he goes limited, but I think you'll see him go full both days that he goes in each week. Okay. So those are the three big storylines I had from the first week of camp, but there's all those little play by play updates, all the things you guys have on your recaps, the day of recaps. So let's just get into this, which players stood out over the first week of camp. Cause there's lots of little individual moments for guys, but if you could just say over the course of the week, there were a couple names that maybe caught your eye. Who would those be? Well, I go. I call it pre-pad and and post-pad because everything changes okay, when the good. pads come on because it's just it's just different. I mean, like yeah. defensive backs can't get their hands on wide receivers. Um, you know, there's not as much physicality at the point of attack. There's some, but there's not as much. Um, so you know, I, I think pre pre-pads to me, a couple guys that look good. Andre, so Andre Yoshivash, and I'm not the only one that that would say that he he really popped um, in his role. Um, and I thought DJ Turner played played pretty well as a corner. I thought it felt like every day that he had a knockdown or two somewhere along the way. Uh, I think he had a moment where he got beat once. I thought Dax Hill had good moments. He had a couple where he got beat once. Uh, but then yesterday when they put the pads on, and this is going to probably come off as a negative towards Miles Murphy, but I think it's more of a positive about Amarius Mims. Marius Mims owned him yesterday. Um, and, and, I mean, there were a couple times. Miles Murphy's not a small dude, right? I mean, he's not a gargantuan guy, but he's not a – small guy. There were times where Marius Mims just enveloped him and just locked him up to the point where he couldn't move. And I'm thinking, okay, again, if he plays Miles Murphy every week, um, he's going to dominate this league. And he's not, he's going to play better guys than that. Probably. Although you know, again, they, they have high hopes for miles. They, they believe miles is going to be a big part of the defensive end rotation. And I do too. I think I, I took that as more of a positive on, 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 on a Marius. Cause man, oh man, did he look good yesterday with the pads on. How could it not be a positive for a rookie lineman who you have to the, the first thing that you're questioning about Amarius Mims, and maybe you shouldn't because he's known to be athletic and all of that, is like, okay, this mammoth guy, how well is he gonna move? Are people just gonna be running right by him, running past him? Is, is his footwork gonna be off? I mean, it seems like based on all of the reports coming out about him, and especially those reports about him and Miles Murphy that he had no issue with his footwork, that he had no problem keeping in front. And he was kind of the, looked like more of the veteran presence that was was ready to go. And Miles Murphy was having to counter and, and try to find a way to, to keep up with him. That, I don't see how that could be seen as anything but incredibly exciting as a Bengals. Yeah, and and um, he did have a moment with Sam Hubbard on the non-padded day. Again, they do rush the passer. They, they go pretty full speed where Sam set him up with a pretty savvy veteran move where he faked to the outside and came back to the inside and beat him. But I went and talked to Sam on Sunday and I said, yeah, you got him with a vet move. He goes, eh, you know, we get each other every once in a while. That, 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 that doesn't happen to him. I said, no, I said, I said, I just thought it was a pretty savvy move on your part. I said, but what do you think of him having gone against him? He said, he said, he's really athletic and he said, he gets his hands on you, man. It's hard to get off. And so, uh, and I, you know, Sam's a pretty honest guy with that kind of stuff. So uh, again, I'd, I'd love to see him work more against Trey Hendrickson and Sam Hubbard. Um, but to watch what he did with Miles Murphy was damn impressive. Yeah, I was listening to Paul and, and Jay, and Jay had the comment of, you know, it it looked like you're doing really well there against Miles Murphy. He said, yeah, I had some wins and some losses, and, and Jay commented back, I, I didn't see any losses. Right, I didn't either. <laughs> I saw a loss against Sam Hubbard on a day, but I didn't see any losses yesterday. 
Yeah, I mean, that's just impressive to hear from a guy that, you know, regardless of what your expectations are from Amarius Mims, even if you thought he was going to come out and start for this team and be good from day one, I still think you have some some thoughts of like, this guy didn't get a ton of reps in college. Right. He's going to be a little bit raw. It's going to take him a little bit of time to get up to speed. And I'm not saying it still won't, but just hearing those initial reports being like, he looks like the real deal physically. He's handled himself well initially. Getting off to a, a, a good first step is a really nice surprise or maybe not surprise, but a really nice thing to hear as a Bengals fan. And, and, and I truly think, now that you've seen this, if the progression continues through preseason and into some preseason games, um, I, I honestly think they'll, they're more than willing to plug him in there in week one, even if Trent Brown's ready. I, I do. I mean, uh, he's gotten the opportunity and he's making the most of the opportunity. And meanwhile, Trent Brown just goes and works his his 400 pounds off on the on the side field. So good for you, <laughs> Here we go. I talked about that last week. It's coming. Here comes that Trent Brown narrative. Yep. Who uh, you talked a little bit about Charlie Jones. Uh, and Andre Yoshivash, who has looked good at that third receiver spot? Um, it's funny. It, it's it's kind of a mix and match. It's it's one you know for a chunk it was Yoshivash, and he did not have a great day yesterday. He had a couple of drops, but again, I'm just going to chalk that up to a day. If it's a pattern, then you you know it, it becomes something to talk about. And then Charlie Jones hadn't popped until yesterday. He, he had a couple of really good plays, and I'll be honest, Kendrick Pryor's had a couple of nice red zone reps, um, and and actually played pretty well. Shedrick Jackson's had some moments. They love Hakeem Butler, it seems like. Um, and and he he had one, he had a couple of really good catches on on Sunday. Um, he's the UFL player of the year, big wide receiver, big body wide receiver, who's gotten a cup of coffee in the league with a couple of teams. Um, they had a uh, an on air drill or just quarterbacks throwing to receivers. Um, and Jake Browning made a terrible throw to Butler on on one, and he had to contort his body and just reached up with a hand and just enveloped the football one handed like he had a suction cup. Um, so it's it's a it's a really deep room, and I initially thought they'd only keep six, and I thought it was a cut and dried six. It was Chase, uh, Yoshivash, uh, Jermaine Burton, Higgins, um, uh, Charlie Jones, and Trent Irwin. And I'm not so sure they don't keep seven and hope to keep a couple more of those guys around on the practice squad just in case. The first day of pads is always a, a fun day. It used to be a little bit more fun, though, going back several years where they do things like the Oklahoma drill, yeah. and it was always like a rite of passage for training camp. I'll give you a very brief story. Uh, when I was filling in for the Enquirer, doing some Bengals coverage during training camp one year, uh, first day of pads, Oklahoma drill happens. After practice, we all get to talk to Marvin Lewis. And people are asking a little bit of questions about first day of pads and the Oklahoma drill. I I. I Get muster up the courage to say, eh, did anyone stand out to you or do anything that you liked during the Oklahoma drill? And he looked at me to see who the hell a asked that question, saw a face he didn't recognize, and said, nothing that I would share with you. <laughs> That's a great Marvin Lewis moment. Very, very Marvin-esque answer right there. That is man. Marvin Lewis to a T right there, baby. Exactly. I, shout out my guy, Jed Demuzi, who loves Marvin Lewis, but uh, he wasn't my biggest fan. All right, let's. Uh, anything else to get to on training camp, or are we good there? Yeah, the only other line storyline I think is is Trey Hendrickson. Um, you know, he's missed. He practiced the first day, hasn't practiced since. Um, Zach Taylor said it's a minor injury; wouldn't disclose what the injury is. And I'm going to have to take them at their word for that. But you know, the cynical side of me wonders: is he holding in as well? You know, he sees what Jamar is doing, and maybe he decided, yeah, I'm not going to risk injury in this thing either. To hell with that! I'll, I'll be ready when I need to be ready. Now he's not coming back from any sort of injury, right? Hubbard no, he, had the ankle surgery, but. Correct. He's correct. Good. No, yeah, yeah, no. Trey and Trey practiced full the first day. I don't remember him suffering any. I and that's where the cynical side of me goes. He looked and saw Jamar and went, huh? Yeah, maybe I'll do this too. Yeah, if it was Hubbard, I would be more worried about the ankle. Maybe something's wrong there. But with Henry, well, he hurt his he, knee. He, yeah, he's hurt his knee. He hurt his knee on Sunday night and hasn't practiced since. But apparently, the MRI showed it's nothing specific for for Sam. And I think he'll be back. But he, you know, neither he nor Trey took part in yesterday's practice. And again, Trey has not practiced since the first day. Yeah, that sounds a lot more like maybe potentially another hold-in situation with Trey Hendrickson. Uh, but again, that the silliness he pulled already this offseason is just like, who cares, buddy? Just like, wake us up when the season starts and you better yeah. be playing well. And I'm kind of with you on that. I, I Again, I, I don't know what's being served by that other than you're not you're trying not to risk injury. But, I, you know, for, for a defensive end who's been in the system, uh, it's not a new defensive coordinator. It's not a new system. Um, you know, he's got a basically the same players behind him. He's going to have some players next to him that are going to be different. But for the most part, it's literally, can you line up and go get the passer when you need to go get the passer? He's proven he can do that. Yeah, he's already proven he's a meathead, so I'm not really worried about what, what his tactics are here during the offseason and negotiations. All right, let's move on to the Reds. The Reds are 4-2 and two since we last spoke. 
They're currently 52 and 55, fourth in the NL Central, and nine games back of the first place Brewers. They are four and a half games out of the third wild card spot in the National League. Skinny, of course, the MLB trade deadline came and went. The Reds made some deals prior to the deadline. I'll rattle them off quickly here, and then we can talk a little bit about what's going on. They traded outfielder Austin, they traded outfielder Austin Slater, infielder Levon Soto, and cash considerations to Baltimore for a player to be named or cash. They acquired utility man Davis Wenzel from the Rangers in exchange for cash considerations and then optioned him to AAA. They traded reliever Lucas Sims to the Red Sox for young right-handed pitcher Ovis Portes, who pitched in rookie ball and single A this year. Frankie Montas was traded to the Milwaukee Brewers in exchange for 25-year-old outfielder Joey Weimer and veteran right-handed pitcher Jacob Junis. The Reds also got $1 million in that deal. That was probably the biggest deal that I would take note of. And then finally, they dealt minor league catcher Andrew Salcedo to the Seattle Mariners for six-year veteran Ty France and cash considerations. Skinny, when you hear all of that, you look at what the Reds did leading up to the trade deadline. Are the Reds being reasonable and patient and continuing to work the plan that they set forth two years ago? Or are they caught in between competing now and building something for the future and just doing a whole bunch of nothing at this point? Yeah, I think they're caught in between a little bit, Rick. Um, you know, none of the moves getting guys back move the needle, right? I mean, but I, I will give them this. I mean, look, can you catch Ty France lightning in a bottle for two months? Maybe you can. I mean, he's two years removed from being an all-star, for goodness sakes. And um, so there's something there. Uh, and you gave up literally, and I mean this, maybe the worst player in your whole organization to get him. I mean, that, that, the, the kid, the Salcedo kid, just has never progressed very high. And if you look at his minor league numbers, they're horrifically bad. I, I think I, I think I heard or somebody told me he had gotten up to like either A and had played so poorly that they actually sent him back to developmental. So he, you didn't give up for anything. Like two or three years at the place he's been, right? Double yeah. A or single A, wherever yeah. he was. Yeah, I don't think he's risen above A. So, so yeah, yeah I, I, the Lucas Sims one was interesting because he is our, he is currently a serviceable bullpen arm. I know you know he blew the game on Sunday, but he's a serv. We'll agree he's a serviceable bullpen arm. But to me, you got a prospect back, and I think the Reds do need some prospects as well, especially in the bullpen. And and you know, getting this kid back in exchange, he's pretty high. He's a pretty high prospect in the Red Sox organization. I mean, everything else to me was a big yawn. I mean, you could argue, should they have tried to trade Nick Martinez? Maybe. Um, you know, could they have tried to get something of more significance in the outfield? Maybe, but there weren't a lot of blockbusters in the, there was a lot of trading. There just wasn't a lot of blockbusters that were made. And it feels like there rarely are. Uh, everyone always talks about what all the stuff that's going to happen at the deadline. And it feels like a few teams maybe do something and everyone else is doing a lot like what the Reds did here. The, the other thing I would say skinny is I don't, I mean, this team is not built for a run. And maybe they can catch lightning in a bottle. Maybe something right. will happen for right. them. But even if you were to add a a right-handed hitter in the outfield to add to, to this lineup, what would you have been prepared to give up for that? Because, right. I, I mean, it doesn't really mean anything this year, likely. I mean, best chance Well, you're, you're fighting for a last wild card spot and sneaking your way in. Well, I still, Arizona snuck its way in last year, so there's something to be said about sneaking your way in. But to your point, if you're going to do that, and I think we talked about it on the podcast, I, I wasn't just looking for the rental. I was looking for, hey, if you're going to make that deal, it, it's somebody who's going to be part of your future too. And, uh, right. you know, maybe that guy just wasn't out there and, and there wasn't a trade partner or the, the, the trade partner you thought you had or wanted um, was asking too much in return. And there, there is a line in the sand that you draw, and we're never going to know where that was and who that player, who those players were. Um, and, and I wasn't expecting the needle to be move much for me I, I honestly expected him to maybe sell off a little bit more like I said I'm a little surprised Nick Martinez got traded but not overly surprised I mean he's still um <clears throat> they need somebody to pitch for goodness sakes and, yeah. and and they're running out of arms are you surprised they didn't move Jonathan India no I, I there's a part of me that maybe the solution for the outfield bat we're talking about comes in the offseason where Matt McLean has moved to shortstop India stays at second and you move Ellie De La Cruz to the outfield Wow. You think they would actually do that based on the way his star has risen this year? Uh, I think it's a consideration. Sure. Uh, I mean, you, you've got to, you've got to do something with your outfield. And again, maybe that does come this off season in, in a signing. Um, but you know, to Jonathan India's credit, he's played his way back into the core, right? I, I felt like he played his way very much out of the core uh, as, as you approach spring training that it felt like, you know, where you, where's Jonathan India going to play? Well, he's been a pretty valuable part of this team this year. I didn't have 
much expectations for the trade deadline. I didn't, I didn't really think there was a big move for them to make other than like you said, if there was like an outfielder out there, that would be a multiple year guy that could add to the future. Then that made sense. I didn't really think that was realistic and, and it turned out not to be at the same time. I, I am concerned about, I mean, the, the current roster and what it's set up for over the next year or two doesn't excite me the way it did a year ago. And Understood. that's my biggest concern is just, I, I think th what they did, the trade deadline was probably fine. I don't know that they should have done a lot more. At the same time, when I look at them, I don't really know what the plan is going forward. I I'm not sure that they have a clear plan in place right now and that they're really working that. Yeah, I mean, in your outfield right now, can you really trust TJ Friedel to stay healthy? That's that's part of the mix, right? Um, you got left-handed hitting outfielders who really don't hit. Jake Fairley's hitting for a bit of an average, and I know he's going through a lot of stuff, so I'm going to take that as a little bit of maybe that's the power drain for him. But, I mean, he's honestly, even in his best, even in his best, he's a platoon hitting outfielder who's probably best served as a fourth or fifth outfielder. Will Benson's probably best served being in AAA at the moment. So, yeah, to your point, I just don't know. They're going to have to do something in this offseason to add that outfield bat, whether that's moving Ellie there because that just takes a bat from the infield to the outfield and you're plugging McLean's bat into the infield and you're expecting Marte to bounce back and you're expecting uh, CES to bounce back. Um, and maybe then you can move Spencer Steer back to the outfield as a left fielder. And, uh, you know, you got an outfield of Friedel and right Ellie in center and, and, uh, and uh, steer in left. And that's a pretty good outfield and in, in, on paper. Uh, but yeah, I don't know what, what what the plan is. I you know the one good part of the season is what we've seen from really the top of the rotation. They've emerged into guys as long as they're healthy, and that's the big if with Nick Lodolo. That emerges guys who I think you can count on for many years to come. But that's almost the frustrating part of this season. I know. To me. It's like if that happened, I would have thought this team was a surefire playoff team, and well, we feel great about the future. Part of the problem is Hunter Green has thrown uh, out of his last three starts, two of them he's thrown seven innings of shutout baseball, and they didn't win either game. That's right. frustrating. Right. And that's exactly the problem. It's like you would think if Hunter Green had the year that he was he's had to this point, Nick Lodolo had the year that he had to this point. And I mean, even some of the other pitching that they've gotten has been great. And yet there's zero excitement from my perspective about what they have coming back next year. I mean, I just don't see the uh, the optimism about the future at this point. And that that's really discouraging. Can, can, can you um, answer this? How, how, how does a guy steal four bases in a game and not, and not score a run? That's incredible. I've never it's, seen it's something impossible. like that. Stealing four bases is incredible, by the yes, way. Yes, it is. That's yes, pretty is. insane to watch. It is. Yeah. Steal four bases in the middle of your order comes up, which is not a very good middle of the order. We'll agree with that. But the middle yeah. of your order comes up, and he doesn't score a single solitary run. Whew. It's almost impossible. Uh, the Reds activated TJ Friedel, an option to AAA outfielder Reese Hines over the course of the last week. After his incredible six-game stretch to start his career, during which he hit 500 with five home runs, Hines went one for 16 over his next four games before he was optioned to AAA. Do you think the Reds made the right decision to send Reese Hines back to Louisville and keep Will Benson? I, I, I do, and I know that, again, there's so many left-handed hitting outfield bats, it seems like you'd like to keep the right-handed guy around. But the one thing I think you'd like to do with Reese Hines is say, hey, listen, you had a nice little level of success for, for a few days. Then they kind of did this adjustment. So now let's go to Louisville and let's – uh, let's take some of the things you learned up here at the big league level, transfer him down there, get get real confidence going, and then maybe bring him back in September and see what see what happens there. I I do think it was the right. I, I would have hated to see the kid get in a one for thirty rut up here, fall into whatever bad habits he was having at Louisville that led to him hitting two sixteen and striking out all the time, um, and maybe just having some level of. Hey, I did have success at the big league level. It wasn't a long level, but I had success there. Um, and let me figure out what I did to have that success and transfer that down to AAA, and then have success down there and come back up and do it again in the big leagues. I, I do think it was the right move. There was a lot of hand-wringing about this when it happened, and I get that from the standpoint of wanting to compete right now. Like, do I think Reese Hines is a better player to have on your roster currently than Will Benson, given he just went through that insane power surge right. and there's maybe upside that he could do something like that or at least give you a, a right-handed power hitter in your lineup compared to essentially nothing from Will Benson? Yes, I do think that's probably a better move for this current team. But this move wasn't made for this year's team. This move was made for Reese Hines and his development and his future. And I think that's the right thing because I also don't think he's good enough to help push this team over the edge Agreed. this year. Agreed. And neither he or Will Benson was going to do that. Is he a better player than Will Benson? Quite possibly. Is he going to give you more than Will Benson the rest of this year? Maybe that's definitely arguable. But what is not arguable is that for Reese Hines' future, 
it's best that he develops a little bit more slowly, goes back to AAA and works on some of the things that he needs to work on. Agreed, 100%. Any other thoughts on the Reds here? No, it's just it's you know, it's it's been so frustrating to watch them sweep or beat good teams and then flip around. It feels like they've pissed away so many games. You know, the Hunter Green start against Detroit where they, you know, had a chance to win that one and should have won that one. The one this this week where you go seven shutout innings and they lose the Sunday game. Uh, you know, you flip you flip 3 to 5 to 6 of these goofy losses the way they've lost them around. I mean, you're very much in the playoff mix. But I'm not talking about a, a big turn. I'm talking about three to six games. Skinny, they're eight and 19 in one run games. Well, eight and 19 in one run games. There's only like one other team in the major leagues that's that bad. Well, I'll say this David Bell couldn't have mismanaged Sunday's game any worse with the bullpen. He could not. I don't know what the aversion is to Sam Mole. I know, you know, he's afraid of him against right handed hitters. And if you look at his splits, I mean, right handers hitting better than, they, than left handers do. That's usually a natural, but it's not like. Right-handers are batting 390 off the guy with a thousand OPS for goodness sakes, um, and then with the bases loaded, arguably your your wildest reliever, Lucas Sims, who averages five walks per nine innings, and I think if I crunch the numbers the other way, I looked at it, he's clearly the, the the wildest of the group in that regard. You bring him into the high leverage bases loaded situation, and what does he do with the first guy? Walks in the go ahead, what turned out to be the winning run. What are we doing? What are we doing? And their, right. situa their situational hitting is embarrassing. It, you know, I, listen, I know people and our friend Mo Eger hates the contact play, and we can argue those merits. I'm not going to dive into that. Um, but it is a thing that you go on contact. You know what else the hitter can do? And I know it's major league pitching. But, you know, the other day, Jamer, Jamer Candelario with, with Ellie on second base, you got to pull a ball to get him to third. Instead, he tries to slap one the other way. It hits it right at the shortstop. That's where Ellie got thrown out at third. He got caught in no man's land. You know, spent the, other, the, the Detroit game on that Friday night, guy on third, the tying run. And what does Tyler Stevens do? He hits a slow grounder to, to third for the contact play. Guy's thrown out at the plate. Ellie gets thrown out on a contact play. How about we situational hit better? That's an option. No one wants to hear that. Uh, but that is an option. The problem is this team just isn't good enough. That's what it comes down to. This That's team has not down. been good enough all year long. Yep. Uh, skinny, quickly here, update, uh, not college basketball exactly, but the TBT, you're familiar with it. A lot of oh, alumni sure. teams play yep. in it. And in this case, we're talking about La Familia, which is the Kentucky alumni team participating in TBT, which stands for the basketball tournament, and the Ville, which is the Louisville alumni team. UK's alumni won that game 70 to 61, but then afterwards, there was almost a fight on the floor due to Chinanu Onowaku spitting at Nate Stastina, two glorious members of those two programs. <laughs> I mean, you see, you talk about two of the, you know, the, the, End of the bench, who are they, guys? In fact, initially when I saw Nate Sestina, I went, who? oh, yeah, I kind of remember him. I, I He was like from Bucknell? Is that right? That sounds right. Yeah, he was from a, a small mid-major, transferred to UK, played for a year. Um, but basically, it all started because Nate Sestina was doing the L's down like this. And Chinanu Onowaku took offense to that, came up and said, don't be doing that stuff anymore and spit at him. Then, then, you know, the Harrison twins are involved and, and, and Willie Cauley Stein's involved. And there's a guys pushing on the court and being separated and yelling at each other. It didn't come to fisticuffs. Although uh, one of the Kentucky writers, Drew Franklin, I think had a punch thrown at him by a fan. What do you got on players and fans getting this worked up over the TBT? Um, 13,500, right? In Freedom Hall. Shattered think, the TBT attendance record, which I think is really cool that they played the game in Freedom Hall, right? I mean, yeah, the Yum great. Center probably would have been out of place, but I, I think that I, I think we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Somebody asked a question of some of my favorite venues, and I, I said well, Freedom yeah, Hall was was on on the list. Um, I, I think it's great to see players still have pride in their school. I mean, obviously, my man did not like the L's down. He did not like his school being dissed, and he's still fighting for his school, man. Good for you, guy. I mean, on one hand, that's kind of cool on the other hand how big of a loser do you have to be to actually want to fight over guys doing hand signals about college team it's it's the same thing as the horns down with texas people Correct. getting worked up over that why would you care why would you ever care that someone's doing that um if i'm a player i might because again it's a one million dollar winner all take prize i'm a little pissed at the moment i lost out on the million dollar take prize and he's dissing me on my floor I, but the hand, I mean, you I would, know me, man, I'm so old school. I think it's childish and nonsensical. Of course it is. You, you think that, but you're, I mean, I don't know. I, you're caught right in between. You might be Chinanu Onowaku here. If this was us playing in a game, you might be the one coming over fighting and spitting on people for doing L's down. 
No, nah, trust me. I, I, I don't think I, I don't think I would take it quite that, that seriously. I mean, again, the million dollar first prize is a big deal for goodness sakes, but um, uh, I mean, hey, by the way, I, they're actually in a spot where they're competing for that. They are deep enough into the tournament where they have a yes. chance to win it now. So yeah, that the, is the, the Kentucky's in the semifinals now, right? Yeah, that, that was the quarterfinal. Yeah. So they actually have a legit shot. But Skinny, I, I think this was, I don't think there had to be a dime on the line for that game. This is Kentucky Louisville. This is no about a million. This is Kentucky Louisville. It, 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 and some some players that people actually remembered and knew, not and not the guys that got in the fight, mind you, but but a lot of players that pe people remembered and knew. By the way, I got to give a shout out to you for for correctly calling this what it is, the TBT. Some people call it the TBT tournament. That would be the basketball tournament tournament. It's like people call the – it's one of my pet peeves. People call the MAC conference. No, it's the MAC, the Mid-American Conference, not the Mid-American Conference Conference. So yeah, shout well, out to you, Rick. You got it right. I, well, I, I appreciate that. But I actually will take up for the people who do it wrong sometimes because it's like MLB, right? You wouldn't say the Major League Baseball, but you would say the MLB on occasion. And I think that's just speaking normally. I, I, I Like I get that these are acronyms. But we use them as their own words at some point, like MLB, NBA, all these things. We don't ever say them by their full name. They True become that. their own thing. So I think I think it's normal to talk like that and say like the MLB or uh, the, the TBT is kind of hard to explain what you mean when you say the TBT. So I get and that's, and that's, why some people sometimes I mean, add that. It, it isn't the very catchy title for, for, for the basketball tournament. Oh, OK. We couldn't be better than that. Yeah, I, I remember when they brought it out at the time. It was kind of like, a, oh, wow, everyone in the world could just play basketball against each other for money. And it was like this crazy concept. And really, it's just become alumni teams. Right. But back then, it was like the idea was like we've all heard about these uh, Michael Jordan drug dealers that just never made it to the league because they were out selling crack till two in the morning or whatever in the in the inner city. Now they'll have their chance to to show us all. And like that never really came to fruition. But. Correct. And, and I, yeah, I mean the, the old schoolyard legends of New York, right. From, from the days before there was internet and, and people with, with phone shooting video of uh guy, guy calls himself the helicopter who's five eleven could touch the top of the backboard. Could he yeah. really, I mean, could he really, maybe they all had sweet nicknames too. Yes, they did. Yep. Yeah. For sure. And they show up at the Devereaux league now and the Smith league play against Paul McMillan. Uh, all right, let's go. Let's go to some oh, Paul, Paul was a good player now. Horrible human being, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, ask any anything. Let's go on to that. Uh, the, the, the bit that just won't quit are little Debbie rankings. Which, I meant, to, and I'm so sorry. You texted me. Who made that graphic? I did. I put out a graphic. You last did week. it. You yeah. did it. I meant to say something back to you. I got busy that day and I actually was scrolling through my phone. Um, to, I was going to text you about when do you want to do the podcast this week? And I saw that. I went, oh, I forgot to mention that to him. That was really cool. No, So we put out the graphic and that stirred up a little more conversation about this. And people were getting kind of mad at us because they were like, you forgot this and you forgot that. And I was like, well, hold on. We were given nine to rank. Correct. These, Correct. these weren't your rankings of any Swiss uh, or any little Debbie cake ever. So here are a few that people were very worked up about that we didn't have included okay. that you might need to now like re-rank a little bit. All right. Um, you had the cupcakes in there, I believe. That was one that people were worked up about. But uh, Swiss cake rolls. Where yeah. would you have a Swiss cake roll? They're, 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 they're literally a ho-ho. They're, they're ho -ho. That's exactly what they are. Where did I have the ho-hos ranked? I had them ranked down towards the bottom, didn't I? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think that's right. I can I can pull up, pull up our, gra if, if our handy graphic if, here. If I, if I recall right, um, my mom, back when I was a kid, would switch up getting the ho-hos and the Swiss cake rolls. And I, I don't think I ever really differentiated. You had the uh, ho hos at number eight. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I think Swiss cake rolls are better than ho hos and the cupcakes, personally. But I told you, I think cupcakes are underrated. To each their own. That's fair. Um, cosmic brownies. Where would you have cosmic brownies? I don't know what that is. I'm not sure I've had a cosmic brownie. You've never had the brownie? They're just the one with the little uh, colored sprinkles on it. The brownie, though. No, honestly, um, we don't have a lot of baked goods around here. But um, if I'm going to eat a brownie, it's going to be like Duncan Hines made in the oven brownie i'm not buying one of those no 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 thank you no, that, that seems it. reasonable yeah I'm, no i'm not i'm not <laughs> you're, you're insane you uh, are insane what about the honey buns where would, Ooh, where would not you a, yeah, buns new absolutely list? listen i've been at plenty of events like where they have some snack foods out and honey buns you know even in like sometimes back in media room days if it was a tournament and they were like you'd have the honey bun in the thing nope nope i would I'll, honestly i'll eat cardboard before i eat, before I eat a honey bun so, all right, so there you go. People were all worked up that we didn't have those, but none of those would have ranked very highly for you. No, they would not have. They, um, the, the, I would say this: the Swiss cake rolls probably would have knocked the nutty, nutty, nutter butters out of the top nine. 
Okay, so that's that's the only one that would have even been above Nutter. Right. Nutty Buddies. Right. Yeah. All right. Here we go. So uh, I think we can finally put an end to our little Debbie rankings, but that that went on for now three weeks, I believe. Um, Skinny, should the Bengals reconsider and induct an old timers class into the Ring of Honor? I've thought that. I, Rick, I, I go back to. I, I honestly think they should have had the initial class of ten. Right? They had. They 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 have plenty of history. Fifty years of history. Um, with with plenty of players who were worthy of going in. I mean, they're still to this day now worthy. I mean, my case for Lamar Paris, we've talked about James Brooks. I, I do. And, and I think he could have gotten Dave Lapham in that in, initial class. I think a couple of coaches need to be in. I think Forrest Gregg and Sam Weish need to be in at some point. Right. I mean, took them to Super Bowls. I think that's at least noteworthy. And so, yeah, I, I wish they'd have done a class of 10 and maybe to catch up before some of these guys pass. Let's get a, four, let's, let's get a class of four to catch up and, and, and cause you're going to start getting some of the, Andrew Whitworth's going to come into play sooner rather than later, and AJ Green and um, uh, Geno Atkins and, and those type of guys. Um, I, I just, yes, to answer that question, yes. Yeah, I think. I mean, just looking at the list right now that was left on there, Parrish was the obvious one that we'd already talked yeah. about. I think Dave Lapham would be a good name to include with this group. Uh, Bob Trumpy was another name that's on there that would maybe fit in there. I don't know if he's going to get in on his own otherwise. Right. Right. Um, so yeah, I think I think there are a handful of names that they could still do that with. Um, I don't know how you reintroduce that now. It probably would have been better at the start, but that's what yeah would do something. I just I don't know if they thought they were going to run out of people if they did like a 10 member initial class and then added two a year. I just don't think they would have. I think they were probably concerned about watering it down too much because you put those in. Then, like you said, you start moving on to the Andrew Whitworths of the world like already. Then all of a sudden now you're like, well, who's next? And you're probably putting in guys that don't deserve it. So, um, yeah, but if I if I. OK, so if, if I'd have had my initial class, you have you have Paul Brown Munoz, Ken Anderson, Ken Riley. Lap him because of all the things he's done. The two coaches I mentioned, we're already up to seven yeah. before we even talk. Lamar Parrish is in that group. I'm, I'm now up to eight, and I'm not the boomer yet. I mean, so I, I think you could have done an initial 10-player class. Yeah, I think you could have done it too. I think what we laid out was their concern probably. I'm not saying it was correct, but I think that's probably why they didn't do that. I wasn't even uh, a chance at that point. Yeah, so looking, yeah, I think you could have done it. Looking back on that now, though, it does feel like it's going to. there are a couple guys that are probably not going to get in that – you probably want in if you're the Bengals. So yes. not sure how you rectify that situation. What is Skinny's favorite NFL city to cover the Bengals in? Um, Believe it or not, I've never had a bad time in Cleveland. Never. In fact, we've almost had too good of a time in Cleveland. Because you guys just know like your breweries that you want to go to there. Yes. You kind of have the spots picked out already, right? We, we we do. And it's just, I don't know. It's just the trip is good because you can drive up on your own time and you're not feeling, you know, the pressure of catching a flight. And, you know, it, you, you know, it's going to be a quick stay because you're going to go out and, and, and hit the town on Saturday night. It's usually a one o'clock kickoff on a Sunday. Get your work done. Hop in the car, drive back home. And it, it's a quick weekend. Um, that That's way up there for me. I liked Kansas City initially. I'm just sick of going there, to be honest with you. And it's always damn cold. Now, this year is different because it's the second game of the year. Maybe I'll change my mind. I've never had a bad time in Kansas City either. It's just I'm kind of sick of going there, for goodness do you, sakes. Do you guys go out to that like Kansas City Live area when you go there? We, we have. Um, the last time, um, a handful of us stayed more downtown towards a place called the Grand Falloon. And uh, there was a steakhouse down there. It's so like I think six of us went and had dinner there and some other people went to another, another spot and, and Baltimore's way up there on my list too. I mean, it's just um, where, where we usually stay is, is a walking distance to the stadium. There's kind of the same, the same, you know, date night before restaurant we go to for just great seafood. And then there's a little spot across from the hotel after you get done working um, after the game and to go have a, a couple of beers before you wind down. It's just usually an easy trip because it's a direct flight there, direct flight back. You're not worried about anything. And it is, it's great. It, where that is, I, it, it's just always been a, a great trip for me. I'm with you though. I think most of my trips, I would really like the ones where I could drive to on my own. I, I like just the, the less stress of not having to get the flight and everything. Yeah, when I covered the SEC, um, uh, Columbia, South Carolina was way up on my list. You wouldn't think that probably. I don't know why. It just was. It was clean, nice, good restaurant scene, good bar scene. Um, again, a hotel convenient to the arena. It was. I always loved that trip. Two of my cousins went there, and they rave about that area. Just say yeah, it's so I, much fun. It and it's just. I mean, it just even flying over, you're like that's just like the idyllic city to live in it i mean all the houses look clean. nice it's clean nice. yeah the nice tree line it, it is it, it was one of my one of my favorites by far all right this one will be good 
rate these sports commentators from worst to, I guess, best. Okay, hang on. Before I even get, if Dwayne Wade's on this list, he is clearly the worst in the history of Dwayne of, Wade. Yes, awful. Just <laughs> awful. I have not he, heard him yet. Do you, oh, you didn't get a chance to watch the game on Sunday. I forgot you had a birthday party. Oh yeah, I did not. So he's doing an analysis. I didn't realize. I that. thought he was. I thought he was brutal. Just oh, I, I can't wait to listen. And as we're doing this today, I think they play the South Sudan today, right? Three yeah. o'clock as we're doing this. So I'm assuming that, yeah. he's doing the game so you can catch Dwayne Wade. Then you can let me know what you think of Dwayne Wade. I will do that on the next next show. So here's the list we have of five commentators, talking heads. Skip Bayless, Colin Cowherd, Adam Schefter, Shannon Sharp, Stephen A. Smith. I have to rate a best out of that group? Worst to best. Skip Bayless and Shannon Sharp are tied for the bottom. I, I believe it, I'm going to put Schefter at the top because even though I said last week and I meant what I said, that his head so far up agents' asses he can't decide between night and day. He does provide useful information, yes. uh, so he's he goes to the top of the list. He's different than these other guys because he actually reports. I've I used to believe it, I, I used to be when Colin was on a station in Portland, Oregon, um, and um. We were somehow, I used to go on his show some, and I I used to enjoy actually the interview banter with him. It was quick. We got to a lot of things very quickly. And when he went national, I thought, I'm going to really like him. And now he's kind of over the top bombastic, but I'm actually going to put him number two because I can at least I can at least listen to him in small doses. I can't listen to the others. I just can't. Yeah. I, and Stephen A's become a caricature of himself. I mean, honestly, he's like Stephen A. Smith playing Stephen A. Smith playing another version of Stephen A. Smith. Yeah, he is Stephen A. Smith playing Stephen A. Smith, who now is reacting to the memes online of Stephen A. Smith. So yes. He's just trying to recreate yes. those moments all the time. Yes. Yes. Um, and for that reason, I actually don't hate him as much because like he's clearly just cashing in and trying to make as much money as possible, be as famous as possible. And like he's he's completely committed to the character and he's yes. made that clear to everyone to, to a point that I almost don't even mind it anymore. Like he's sort of different, I would say, than even Skip Bayless. Skip Bayless is like still tries to act like these are real takes and he still tries to come. I mean, just flip-flops every day with what he's saying. Stephen A. Smith, at least, uh, I think he's annoying and he does all the things, but like he does it a bit more legitimate in terms of his actual takes that he's giving. Yeah, I, I used to be on an email thing where I'd get uh, television ratings for those sports shows and what they did. Yeah. I don't get that anymore for whatever. Maybe it goes to my junk mail for all I know. I really don't know why I don't. And I, some of the ratings for that Skip Bayless Undisputed show was like, 36,000 people across the country were watching it. It's like, Nothing. good Lord, that's that's like a small city in Kentucky. And it's like a sad YouTube channel. You're correct. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I would go Schefter, Coward. I actually think Colin Cowherd does a pretty good radio show. I don't like him. He is annoying, but like he comes up with good topics. Yes. He has a legitimate thought out I, take for each segment. Yeah. I, like I said, I can take him in doses. If, I, if it was an hour car ride and you said, put a gun to my head and, and said that you're going to have to listen to this guy for the next hour. You might as well just shoot me at that point, but I can listen to it in small doses. Yeah. So you went, you went Schefter cowherd and then the other three are tied for last. No matter what. Yeah. Okay. No matter what you honestly put him in a box. I'll pull a name out. That guy's third. Yeah. I would go Schefter. No, you coward. know what I do? I'd, bur I'd no. burn the box so I wouldn't have to pull a name out. Never mind. That makes sense. That's good. <laughs> All right, if Skinny had to pick one person to represent planet Earth as we're meeting the aliens for the first time, who would it be? Joe Biden, because because let, let, let him try to explain things to them, and they'll go, "Are all Earthlings like this guy? Do all, do, do they do, 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 you, do you take me to your leader? Do you just want?" them to be unafraid of us you want us to want them to think we're not a threat or what because i was thinking the opposite i was like either like shack or, or barkley the Bar Bar barkley would be a good one see i want someone that i want them to think like we're a little bit intimidated i want the rock or shack someone who has a personality but is like just a mammoth human being so it's like all right they're not to be messed with they're out there they're coming soon by the way i think they're already here they may already be here you're right yeah they're among us uh and finally we'll wrap it up with this what do you view as your biggest on-air screw-up? I mean, I'm not per I'm not perfect by answer. I'm not sure I've had a big on-air screw-up. Maybe I have that somebody's trying to make me recall, but I don't really recall having a major on-air screw-up. I mean, yeah, I was thinking we talked about a lot of stuff on here in terms of old moments, but I can't remember one that was like a super uh, embarrassing or something that you shouldn't have done or anything like I that that's ever really come up. 
I I came close once. So back when I anchored some, um, uh, we used to have to tape a morning sports cast. And the very first time, I mean, the second weekend I ever anchored, you kind of take the script from the original sports cast and you kind of condense it, just take out, you know, you don't you do everything that was in the sports cast, just kind of the bigger moments. So we rearrange a script. And so it's coming up and, you know, you're supposed to ad lib the goodbye. Right. So at the very end, I got done with it and I almost said it. I said, um, that's your morning sports. I'm. And I had to pause for a second because some wise ass put Ron Burgundy on the on the teleprompter. And I said my name without it. And we I said, that was a good try. That would have been good. I said, except for the <laughs> fact that we would have had to do this thing again. Yeah, that's that's the problem. If you, you know, you start doing pulling gags like that and then everyone has to stay an extra 20, 30 minutes. It's not funny anymore. So, yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, uh, biggest on air screw up is tough. I mean, it's like when, when people, th and that's what you're so good at usually is people come up with these questions and you've got something right off the top. I do. I, and, and I, listen, you, you know me, I, I'm pretty self deprecating. Mistakes oh, I've made, I own them. I'll, I'll, I'll load up. I just, I, I honestly don't recall like a major screw up where I thought, oh gosh, I'm about to crap my pants. Yeah. Or nothing. Cause I can use, I will tell you this. Job. There's times I've lost a train of thought on a question that's come maybe from the studio and I, I'm pretty good at ad lib, and I think so. I kind of ad lib my way back to the initial point, or the, at least the point I want to make. And so I, I usually don't worry too much about that. Yeah. Was there ever something you said that was um, too off color or too? I mean, I know you get told occasionally, being like, "Hey, like, let watch it, turn it down a little bit." But have you ever said something where you're like, "Oh, that was one I probably shouldn't have said." Okay, there is one moment in that regard. That that yeah, and I did it on the I did it on the radio. So Tom Gamble, my radio partner, and I. It wasn't fake when we would argue about stuff. He has opinion. I got opinion and we'd go back and forth. Well, sometimes he's so rigid in some stu stupidity and so am I. He was rigid on some stupid take one day. I couldn't remember what it was. So I took my headset off. I think we were doing the show with Trumpy that. Oh, no, it was just him and I. I threw I threw a headset at Trumpy once and it recoiled and almost hit Tom in the head. But I took my headset off and I, I threw it down and I said, you're so full of S on the air and I walk, I burst out, I like burst out of the studio. And then I realized I just said that on the air. Whew, darn it. And what, what happened there? Did you get uh, like, I can't, we do didn't, that. I, I thought we did. We had another one once where um, a guy would pre-record a sports cast. Like he'd do some of the overnight stuff. Um, and then he pre-recorded a sports cast that we could run in the mornings. So, so the producer for our show comes in and he's, he's running late. He barely gets in there in enough time to get us up on the air. So he hasn't checked on anything. So we do our opening 15 minutes and then take it to the sports cast. I think the sports cast was on the 12s or on the whatever it was. It was one of those goofy things. Yeah. And all of a sudden, hey, you hear the three, two, one. I'm da 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 da. F. Ah, I F this up. F. And he and I are both. Initially, I'm like kind of sitting there because it's six o'clock in the morning. I'm like, all right, we're in the first segment. And we both hear this. And the producer walked out of the room for a moment and he hears it from down the hall and he comes running in trying to push every button known to mankind. Thank goodness it was pretty early in the morning. We did have the phone lines light up for a minute going, you guys realize that that one? Yeah, we sure do realize that. That was not me doing it, but um, I do remember that. That, that. that is always, I mean, that is something that actually happens a decent amount in terms of the, you know, guys who will never say anything wrong on air. If you listen to them and record their stuff, if it's a pretty oh, yeah. important thing, that is a constant like MF this. I'm so effing dumb. You, people get so frustrated when they mess up a recording. Yep. If that's recorded, you got to be very careful to make sure that's cut out and you're, you're taking the right take. Because it's like the first five seconds might have been fine if you only checked the end point. Yep. You got to yep. make sure it was good all the way through. I, I've seen that happen a few times when I worked. Yeah, that, that, did, that obviously did not get double checked whatsoever. <laughs> yeah, that's that's tough. All right, good stuff. That's all we got. I right, appreciate it very much. We'll be back next week as the Bengals inch closer already to preseason game number one as training camp rolls along. For Rick Broing, I'm Richard Skinner. It's been the Skinny Podcast, the weekly Pope edition, presented by Blake, the attorney Mazelin.